Save me, O God, for the flood waters are up to my neck. Deeper and deeper I sink into the mire and I can't find a foothold. I'm in deep water and the floods overwhelm me. I am exhausted from crying for help and my throat is parched. My eyes are swollen with weeping, waiting for my God to help me, waiting for breakthrough. Those are the words from Psalm 69 from King David, one of the most powerful men who ever lived. And so I just want you to know, if you have ever felt like you're sinking, you can relate to those words. And so can King David. And this is something that all of us can relate to, especially those who might say that you struggle with addiction. You say, I can relate to those words, the sinking, drowning, hopeless feeling of being pulled down against your will by something, some evil desire, some addiction in your life. I thought of those words this past summer when I heard that a friend of mine had drowned in the river south of the community where I had my first ministry. His name was, was Nathan. And Nathan had a hard life and long before I met him. But by the time I had met him, Nathan had been addicted to drugs for quite some time. And I know that Nathan wanted to stop and he tried desperately and again and again felt like he failed. But I know this because I met with him monthly and we would get lunch or something. And each time we got together, I would encourage him and say, Nathan, your identity is not this addiction. You are a child of God and you are still not Nathan the addict. He wasn't Nathan the user. He was and still is Nathan, a child of God and my friend. I want to welcome you to Compass Christian Church today. My name is Luke Davidson. I'm the campus pastor here. And uh, if you're new around here, I would love to meet you after the service. And you can also just stop by our next steps area. There's that big blue banner over there. And there's little gift bags. We have a gift that we'd love to give you just as our way of saying thanks for being here with us today. But we are continuing in a series called Breakthrough because barriers are meant to be broken. That's kind of where we're launching out of. And if you missed last week's message, I kind of set it up. Make sure you go back and listen to it. It'll help kind of frame the series for you. And you can do that on our website, mycompasschurch.com. Of course, you can always stream in live with us because we stream our services live on Facebook every Sunday. Just go to Compass Church NRH. In fact, would you guys make some noise for everybody joining us on Facebook right now? Thank, thank you all for streaming in with us today. And then uh, we have a Compass app that you can download that helps you stay connected as well. But today, I want to talk about breaking through addiction. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about overcoming, breaking through the greatest barriers of our lives. Today, I want to talk about breaking through addiction. Henry Cloud gives five warning signs of addiction. Number one, your responsibilities begin to suffer. Your responsibilities begin to suffer, meaning things just start falling behind and you lose track of stuff because addiction or lack of self-control and responsibility, they kind of go hand in hand. You kind of lose track of things because other things kind of begin to become a priority for you over the things that should be a priority maybe. Number two, you find yourself needing a little bit more, maybe what you used to be able to experience with one or two, well, now it takes three or four, or now it takes six or seven in order to have the same experience. Maybe you even find yourself experiencing a little withdrawal when you don't have it. Number three, that kind of leads to, number three, you find the need for a regular fix, whatever regular is for you. Maybe it's once a month, it's like, I gotta do this, or uh, once a week, or daily, or maybe that interval gets even shorter, it's like hours in between needing this fix. And that kind of leads to number four, which is you know you need to stop, you need to cut back, and you tried and you were unable to. That's when you know you've lost your freedom. And instead of you controlling this thing and enjoying it, it now controls you. And then number five, you keep doing it with greater and greater risks. And so you've had too much, but you say, it's okay, I can drive home. It's just six blocks, just a half a mile. No, you can't, because you're drunk. Don't do it. Or you start to risk not only your own safety, but maybe you risk work, like you mess work for your addiction, or you risk exposing it to your kids at a greater and greater pace, or you risk not only your career, but your marriage or your relationships, your friendships even. You just take huge risks in, in order to satisfy an addiction. These are the warning signs. But I think maybe the most tragic things that happen is that addiction separates us from the life we were meant to live. It does. There's a life that God has for you and virtues that are meant to be powerful in your life. And addiction threatens to separate you from those things and single you out and isolate you and try to destroy you. I think back to my friend, Nathan. Addiction tried to separate him from the life he was meant to live. Addiction often made him 
selfish and made him lie and he would neglect his family sometimes. Those aren't the things that Nathan really was. The truth is Nathan was very selfless and very caring and sacrificial. I'll never forget when we decided we're moving to Texas, we're gonna be a part of this church. When I told Nathan, he wanted to fix the air conditioner in my Jeep because it had been out and I was moving to Texas. Thank goodness, I didn't know how hot it is here. It's hot. <laughs> and so he and his uncle, they took like my whole dash out. I don't know if you've ever seen this done, but to get it to the evaporator and to replace the heater core, if car guys, you know what I'm talking about, took everything out of the, <laughs> of the car and then replaced it, put it all back in for free. That's the kind of guy Nathan was. Addiction tried to separate him from that. And I just tell you that because addiction will try to separate you from who you were meant to be and the life that God wants you to live as well. Now, the problem is right now, most of us are probably thinking about those people, you know, the other people, the addicts, those addicts out there. But I don't want you to think about that because I would say pretty much everybody in this room you struggle with an addiction. We just think it's an acceptable addiction, right? It's acceptable. Chocolate is acceptable. Do I have any chocolate addicts in here? Say, so I'm not thinking, yeah, hey, a little bit. She so like, a little bit, I'll get it up. Uh, you know, food is an addiction, or coffee, or Coke, or Diet Coke. We say, it's an acceptable addiction. Or white lies. We say, you know, it just, it kind of helps smooth things out, and everybody doesn't have to know everything. I'll just kind of smooth it out. A little white lie won't hurt anything. Shopping say, it's not, it's acceptable. I can, I can shop. I make enough money. Fantasy football or sports. Some of y'all are like, Luke, you're just stepping on my toes now. Back off a little bit. Um, a little lust here and there. You know, I just kind of sprinkle it in. It's not a big problem. It doesn't hurt anybody. I just, I just kind, of, kind of do that from time to time. Video games, jewels are a big thing right now. A little gambling, you just sprinkle it in. It's okay, it's not a big deal. I don't have a problem with that. Or the phone, goodness. Uh, my wife and I, we just get addicted. We call it being addicted to the scroll. We're just like, wah, wah. and then one of us will break it and be like, hey, are you addicted to the scroll? I'm like, yes. And you have to like, <clears throat> you know, just lodge myself from the scroll. But we have all these things that we kind of fall into a rhythm of. We just think it's acceptable. We don't put it in the same category as like a drug addict or an alcoholic. And what I want to point out to you today is that those things that we try to grade, oh, that's acceptable, that's not acceptable, where does this fall on the spectrum? None of those things are the problem. The drug's not the problem. The alcohol is not the problem. The pornography is not the problem. There's something underneath inside of you in your soul that you are turning to those things as an unhealthy way to cope with the hurt inside or the disappointment, or the thing that was done to you, or the stress, or the pressure. So there's something underneath that is hurting, or that is angry. And as a release, you turn to this unhealthy coping mechanism in order to deal with it. And those things want to separate you from who God made you to be. And they find, you find yourself, instead of turning to a God who can comfort and nurture you, you turn to this thing that tries to seek and destroy and to separate you from the relationships that matter most. So if addiction is a lack of self-control and integrity and weakness and dependency and problems and shame, if you find that addiction creates that for you, any of us in this room, I think every person listening, even those of you on Facebook, I think this matters to you. If you've ever struggled with self-control, if you've ever struggled with being dependent on something or feeling shame and turning to something because of your shame that wasn't healthy. Then I think breakthrough might look like this. It might look like liberation. Say, I wanna be set free and broken loose from the chains of this thing. I wanna be set free from it. Freedom from and freedom to. Freedom from this thing that had previously mastered my life. Freedom to follow something new, to, to live the life that I know I'm meant to live and I, and I want to live. Self-control. Instead of saying, I, I can't control my, my feelings, I can't control my actions. Well, you wouldn't breakthrough be to actually have self-control and command of your desires instead of your desires commanding you. To have independence instead of being dependent upon something or an action or anger and just saying, this anger just dominates my life. I'm addicted to anger. How do I break this? Well, I want to be independent of it and I want to command it and I want to have discipline in my life instead of feeling like I'm a victim to this thing. I actually want to have control over it and to learn, discipline myself to know how to react and to overcome it. That 
is breakthrough right there. And this is a person who is mastered by God and not mastered by sin, compulsion, and addiction. This is a person that I think we all wanna be. I wanna be this person. Don't you wanna be this person? I'm gonna be a person of power, self-control, not having something in my life that I don't even like command me and it calls my name and I just submit to it. No, I'm not gonna do what you tell me because I'm gonna have control of my life and I will not be a slave to sin and addiction any longer. Now, we're gonna talk about how to discover that breakthrough today. In 1998, every sports fan was captivated by the home run record pace being set by Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire as they were racing to see who would set the new record. And they broke the record and then were racing against each other, 63, 64 home runs, 66. Finally, Mark McGuire finished the season with 70 home runs. It was incredible, fun to watch a breakthrough for baseball, and every sports fan was captivated. Except it was all sort of a lie because the real breakthrough came shortly after that when it was uncovered that there was a steroid scandal that had infiltrated deep within baseball that involved these two guys. And for that reason, performance enhancing drugs and using them, those home run records will always sort of have an asterisk next to them, won't they? As sort of a timeless tale of what are you willing to justify in order to be an addict? Or what are you willing to praise and to use to justify something that you're abusing in your life? Say, well, I wouldn't have been able to hit that home, many home runs if I hadn't had this. And that's same, that's true for you and me. Do you have things in your life that you feel like, well, Luke, you just don't understand the pressure, what I'm going through. And so you use the achievement or the life or the pressure to justify something that's destroying you. Oh, I have to do this. I, I, I wouldn't be able to work at this pace if I didn't have this as sort of an outlet. Or, Luke, I deserve this. Like, I work hard. I deserve to, to look at some images and to deal a little in lust and pornography. Like, well, it's, it's not hurting anybody. I deserve that. I know it's not what God wants, but it's how I cope. And I deserve that. I want a little release. Or I deserve to go on a shopping spree. I mean, I've, I've worked hard. I can, I can do these things. And so you justify the addiction because of your success. Or maybe you say, Luke, you don't understand, in my climate, in my workplace, I have to wear a mask and I have to be you know, professional and I can't really be myself or else I might risk losing my job. And dealing with that identity separation is really hard. And so I have to cope with it. And so, and so you self-soothe yourself and you medicate yourself with whatever it is, some, some action, doesn't have to be drugs or alcohol, just something that you have lost control of and it controls you and it's how you deal with the separation of your identity in all these different ways. What are you justifying by achievement? Because I think the achievement is not the breakthrough that you should be pushing for. The real breakthrough will come when you can take off the mask and be real with yourself and honest and not live in shame and deception anymore and be real with others as well. And start to live in freedom and control over your desires and self-control. I wanna lean into this a little bit. James chapter one, verses 14 and 15 says, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So, if death is sort of the result or the fruit, and then we see the actions, if we were thinking of like a tree, you've got you know, the branches and the fruit, and that's sort of like the destructive things. You know, it hurts you, these actions destroy relationships, things like that. Then we've got like the trunk, which is the action itself, which is what most people think, you know, that's what you gotta deal with. You gotta get rid of the alcohol, you gotta get rid of the drugs, this compulsive behavior, this anger that's kind of seeping into your life, this little lust, you know, that's the thing, that's the trunk. I'm telling you, that's not the problem. The problem's beneath the surface, it's the roots. And the roots he calls our own evil desires. There's, there's something inside of you that whether because of something that was done to you or something that was something you did or some hurt or pain or anger, I don't know, but there's something inside that's hurt and it's broken and that thing gets enticed and that's what leads you off and wants to destroy you. So the problem is not the thing. The problem is not the shopping. Let me lean into this a little bit because you're not even gonna believe that this is really in the Bible. You're gonna be like, that's in the Bible? Go to, let's go to Colossians chapter two for just a second because it's kind of a crazy verse. So why do you keep following the rules of the world such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. Hey, don't touch that. Don't go there. Don't, go, don't drink that. 
He says, that's just a mere human rule about things that deteriorate as we use them. He said, I'll just put a cage around that and that way I won't go there. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Have you ever built a fence around something that you know is a bad action? You say, I'm not gonna go there, I built a barrier. You know what happens? Not only did you desire that thing, but now you, want to des- now you desire to, to climb over the wall and the barrier and to deceive people. And now you become twice the sinner that you were before because now you become a liar and an addict of this dang thing. So building a barrier around something can actually create more desire. And because you set it off limits, now your desire is just like even more hungry, even more aggressive. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? So don't restrain your sin your addiction, your evil desire. What does he say in chapter three? If you haven't read Colossians chapter three, you need to go read it today, it's powerful. He says, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Don't cage it, don't restrain it, kill it, put it to death. Have nothing to do with sexual morality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. And he goes on and on through the whole chapter. You should read that chapter. What's he saying? I think you could say it this way. Replace, don't restrain. Replace, don't restrain. Let me give you an example. How many of you have a pet? You have a dog or a cat? None of you? Oh, come, let's try that again. How many of you have a pet? Dog or cat? A lot of you, okay? Maybe a fish, something, all right? What if your pet got rabies? Crazy little zombie fish, piranha becomes, you know, something. Or your your dog gets rabies, wants to attack you or something like that. It's, It's unfortunate, right? And unfortunately, you can't cure rabies. So now you've got a zombie dog, you've got a zombie cat that wants to kill you and other things and spread the disease even further. But you love your pet. And you think, well, I don't want to kill my pet. And so you know what? I can just deal with this. We'll just cage the pet in and I can put it on a leash. We'll just put a muzzle on it. And I know it'll, it'll, it'll slobber and stuff, but it'll be okay. I can just control the thing. Are you crazy? You have to put the pet down. You have to euthanize it. You have to kill it. I'm sorry that it hurts your little heart. You got to kill the dog. It's done. It's over. I thought that was important and clear. Just want to make that clear to you. Now, some of you are like, what are you talking about, Luke? Listen, some of you have taken sin in your life and you love it. I mean, let's just be honest because it kind of comforts you. And when you're having a stressful day, you say, I can turn to this thing. It's nice. It makes me feel better about myself. I know it's not really helping me, but it just kind of helps me cope unhealthily. I get that. And so you just kind of build a little cage for it. You say, I can control this. And you put it on a leash and a muzzle and you say, it'll be okay. I can control it. Are you crazy? It's only a matter of time before that thing jumps up and bites you. And it will, and it will hurt you and it will hurt others. You have to kill it. You have to put it to sleep. You got to stop the madness. You have to take this thing and remove it and replace it with something that's actually healthy and something that builds you up. I ran into a quote a couple months ago, so powerful, from St. Philip Neri. It says, when God intends to grant a man any particular virtue, it is his way to let him be tempted to the opposite vice. Wow. That hit me square in the chest because I started to think, man, in these moments of temptation where I feel weak, Man, it's an opportunity actually for me to be strong because I don't just say no to something. I can say yes to something. I'm not just fighting something off. I'm choosing something that's healthy and something that builds me up, something powerful. And so I just wrote down some things. I want you to see every opportunity of temptation, not just as an opportunity to say no to something, but an opportunity to say yes and to choose a virtue because you got a new master. Your master is not sin anymore if you're a follower of Jesus. Your master is God. And so in the moment of temptation, you say, well, God is patient. And so instead of being angry and lashing out, I choose to be patient. That's power. Whenever your temptation, whenever your sin calls you and says, come here, and you say, no, you're not my master. I'm going this way. When you are found in an opportunity to lust and there's temptation, it's not just an opportunity to lust, it's an opportunity to choose purity. When you're shopping and there's this internal desire this, to be compulsive and to say, ah, I'm just going to go on a spree. Well, there's, op- there's actually an, another opportunity there to practice control. When you're in the workplace and there's this thing inside of you that it gets arrogant and prideful, that's not the only opportunity you have. You also have an opportunity to choose humility, which is an incredibly powerful personality of Jesus 
and virtue that you can embody. Whenever it comes to self-care, that's not just an opportunity for you to be lazy. It's an opportunity for you to be diligent and to choose self-care instead of self-loathing. When it comes to your money, money's not just a temptation to be greedy. It's an opportunity to be generous and to be wise. Whenever you're facing intense pressure and you want to get people off of your back, that's not just an opportunity to lie and to deceive so that you can kind of just meander through and deceive people. It's an opportunity to tell the truth. Man, there's power in the distinction between those two choices. When you are being tempted by addiction and it's luring you in and temptation comes against you, that is the moment of breakthrough. That is your opportunity to say no and to say yes. It's an opportunity to have victory. It's not just an opportunity for you to lose. It's an opportunity for you to win, to practice self-control instead of self-gratification and to discover power instead of just weakness. Ryan Holiday echoes this in his book, The Obstacle is the Way. He said, we should see each and every one of these obstacles as an opportunity to practice some virtue, patience, Courage, humility, resourcefulness, reason, justice, and creativity. It's a tough fight. Probably the toughest fight you and I will ever face. And if you've been trying to fight this, you know it's hard. I've been fighting stuff for years. I know that many of you have too. It's a hard fight, but the Holy Spirit will help you in this and train you and teach you and fight right alongside of you and train you in godliness. It's a really powerful verse in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, which says, train yourself to be godly. Get in the gym, put in the sweat, work at it, build up your godliness or discipline yourself to be godly, some translations say. The word in Greek is gymnazo, which means gym, which is where we get the word gymnasium. I looked it up in my Greek lexicon and I about spit my coffee out when I read what it means. You guys see that? <laughs> That is not altered at all. I just screenshotted that, shared it with you. It means to exercise naked. Did you ever think training yourself to be godly? That's the word that they would use. I was like, what's behind this? Well, you just have to understand a little context. In that time, Greek and Roman culture, what's the number one sport? Wrestling. They had schools called palestras and gymnasiums where they would go to work out, to train, and to discipline themselves and to learn how to outmaneuver their opponents. So this is one of those schools, kind of a typical model of what it might've looked like. You see instructors all around and they would go there. They didn't have dry fit. They didn't have under armor. So they take off the robes and everything that hinders and they would train. But the goal here is to outmaneuver your opponent. That's what they're learning to do. So I don't know what you think of when you think of training to be godly. I bet it wasn't that. (laughs) But you maybe think, oh, being godly is to be nice, to be sweet, to know the Bible really well. And I'm telling you, not really, kind of, but training yourself to be godly means getting in the spiritual gym and putting in the work and effort and learning how to outmaneuver your opponent how to outmaneuver Satan and his temptations and how to prepare and react and to plan for the attack that comes to know how to pin down your opponent before your opponent pins you down. That's hard training to be able to overcome and win in the moments of temptation. Are you training that intensely to overcome, to outmaneuver your addiction and sin and evil desires in your life? May 6, 1964. Roger Bannister did something that people thought the human body wasn't capable of. He ran the four minute mile. Some say that people have been trying to break the four minute mile barrier for a thousand years. Nobody could ever do it. They got close, four minutes, three seconds, two seconds, but nobody ever beat the barrier. Roger Bannister did. And then something crazy happened. Six weeks later, an Australian named John Landy did the same thing. Not a thousand years later, six weeks. Weeks later, it was as if a mental barrier had been broken. People didn't think it was possible, so they didn't. But now that they knew it was possible, maybe they started to believe, I think I can do it too. I'll train and we'll, we'll, we'll accomplish it as well. The case is pretty strong because to this day, over 1,400 people have broken the four minute mile barrier. It's incredible. That's 1,400 more people than had done it the previous thousand years. And I just point that out to you because I wanna tell you something today that you don't think is possible and therefore it limits what you even try to accomplish and train yourself for. But if you knew 
that this was possible. And if you could really harness this in your life, it would change everything about how you train yourself to overcome and outmaneuver sin and addiction and evil desires in your life. It would change everything. Are you ready to hear it? You're not going to believe me, but I'm telling you, it's in the Bible. Sin is not your master if you're a follower of Jesus. If you have put your faith and trust in Jesus and been baptized into the body of Christ, sin is not your master. And maybe you don't believe that. You say, Luke, I've tried to say no to sin. I have tried to conquer this thing. I can't beat it. It makes me do stuff that I don't want to do. It overruns my will and dominates my thoughts. I want to read to you some important words from the Bible in Romans chapter six. If you've never read the book of Romans, you should. It's incredible. It's kind of hard to understand at points, but chapter six is one of the powerful chapters. Romans chapter six, it's gonna surprise you perhaps. Verse six says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified, which uh, crucifixion is a, is a way to execute people. It's the way that Jesus was killed by crucifixion, nailing somebody to a cross. It says our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ, with Jesus, so that sin might lose its power in our lives. And he says this powerful thing, we are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. You say, I'm free? Yeah, you're free. Verse 10, when he died, when Jesus died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So to which you say, so what? Like he's Jesus, he's the son of God. He's like superhuman. I can't relate to that guy. And Paul says, no, that's not true. You can relate to this guy. Verse 11, he says, so what's that got to do with you? You also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Really? How? Verse 12, do not let sin control the way you live. To which you say, is that even possible? Can I tell sin not to dictate my life? Can I say no to it? He says, do not give in to evil desires. To which you say, is that even possible? I didn't know that I could say no to it. I didn't know that I didn't have to give in because when it calls my name, I just feel like I have to submit. I have to follow. It's my master. And Paul said, nope, it's not your master. You don't have to do what it says. I won't do what you tell me you can say to it. Verse 13, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God for you were dead, but now you have new life. And then verse 14, sin is no longer your master. Sin is no longer your master. Some of you, sin and addiction has lied to you and it has told you that you're a prisoner. You're not. If you have your faith and trust in Jesus and have been baptized into the body of Christ, the prison doors have been broken open. You can walk out anytime you want. So let me say it again. If you're a follower of Christ, sin is not your master. Lust is not your master. Food is not your master. A lack of self-control in some area of your life is not your master. Alcohol is not your master. Addiction is not your master. Anger and anxiety are not your master. Jealousy is not your master. When you entered into the body of Christ, Jesus did more for you than just forgive you. He came to set you free. And you think, well, I can't help it. Paul says, you may live as if you can't help it. You may say yes to sin and make it your master. You may toy with it and throw it a bone and treat it like a little pet that you can control. And you may say yes to it and make it your master, but sin is not your master. You can go and sin no more. Every morning you can get down on your knees and pray, God, I give you my eyes and my lips and my hands and my feet and my heart and my mind. I surrender all of me to you and I agree with your word that sin is not my master. So I will not submit any member of my body to serving a master who is no longer my master. Guys, when that gets in your heart, it will transform you. But you have to want this. You gotta stop wallowing and pretending that you're a victim. And you got to get in the spiritual gym and start working and training yourself to outmaneuver your opponent and Satan and his temptations and learn how to prepare and react and plan accordingly to say, I don't have to say yes 
to this evil desire that wants to dominate my life because sin is not my master. Somebody in the room, you're just wanting to, you're wanting to stand up and throw your hands in the air and wonder why other people aren't because you have been there and you remember the day when this all clicked for you and you understood, oh, I'm not a prisoner because sin is not my master. You remember the blog or the song that you were listening to or the Bible scripts you were reading or the conversation you were having with somebody over coffee and it all came together. You say, well, I'm not a prisoner to sin. Sin is not my master. <sighs> Breakthrough. And it changed what you knew was possible and changed everything about how you've operated since. And now when sin calls your name, you know that you have a choice. Say, I don't have to follow you. And sometimes as you wrestle, do you lose a round? Yeah. Does that mean you lost the war? No. You're not a prisoner. You're not a slave to sin. You can fight back. And I've got really good news. Even for those of you who haven't put your faith and trust in Christ. Maybe you grew up in church and you got away from it at some point, or maybe you're not sure what you believe. Sin doesn't have to be your master either. And if you ever get fed up with being dragged down and pulled against your will by some sin that wants to destroy you and threaten your career and your life and your marriage and your identity and eats away at your self-worth, if you ever get fed up with that, there's an open invitation from Jesus. Come and follow me and he'll set you free because Jesus broke through what was possible and that changes everything about what's possible for you. I opened this message with a psalm. I wanna close with another powerful psalm. It's a song of breakthrough. A psalm is a song of praise that was sung by the Jewish people many, many years ago. We've long lost the melodies, but here are the words, the lyrics. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what has been done and be amazed and they will put their trust in the Lord. Amen. Looking back on my life, I can see the pattern of how I've lived the same storyline four different times at different points in my life. And each time I created a mask to hide who I really was. I grew up in a very dysfunctional household. We struggled with verbal abuse, physical abuse, alcoholism, I noticed as I started to go to elementary school and then in junior high, my home life wasn't normal. Looking back, that's when I started to develop the first mask that I would wear in public that would protect me from anybody finding out specifically who I was. The instability of my family really came crashing down. We were served with eviction papers. My mother lost custody. The mask that I had created up to that point came crashing down. And it's something that really fueled my addiction in later years of my life. In college, I was able to create a completely new mask, if you will. Unfortunately, nobody really knew who I was and I was always hiding and trying to cope with the shame of my childhood. I really didn't drink a whole heck of a lot in high school, just wasn't exposed to it. But in college, that became normal. And I had no idea the damage that was causing to me emotionally, physically, and to the stability in my life. So just when it seemed that things were really starting to become more normal, I get a phone call from my sister telling me that my mom had left a note on the nightstand saying that she couldn't deal with these circumstances anymore, and she was sorry and she was leaving. This normal, quote unquote, mask that I had created at college once again shattered, and I was forced to deal with the reality of, of life. So my transition to the corporate world was very natural. Everyone in my corporate setting was doing exactly what I was doing. Everybody had a mask. They were one person at home and they were another person in the corporate environment. Alcohol was part of the culture. 
and it suited me just perfectly. The coping mechanisms that I had developed through my youth was working. I created this mask time and time again. The corporate mask that I created came crashing down in the end. It was at that point in my life that I realized the addiction had a hard and a firm grasp on who I was. Before I knew it, most of my waking thoughts were, when was the next happy hour? I had surrounded myself with friends who also drank at the same pace and frequency that I did, so everything seemed normal. Before I even said hello to my kids, before I gave my wife a kiss, it was my first stop. Not literally the next day, but figuratively after a thousand of those days. My marriage is on the brink of divorce. My kids think I'm an angry man. No matter how many masks I had created in my life, I knew the one that I had created through my addiction and through drinking was one that I didn't want any part of anymore. My wife, Janine, I believe in desperation. She said, the only thing I want for Mother's Day is for all four of us to go to church together. And that, that Mother's Day, we went to Compass for the first time. Our life has not been the same since that day. I can honestly tell you, it felt as though somewhere where I belonged. Finally, finally, after 46 years of my life, I had finally walked through the doors of some place that I felt at home and Christ kept pulling me in and pulling me in and pulling me in. And before you knew it, I never felt the need to wear that mask. And I can honestly say with no reservation, our life this past year has been the best life that, that our family has been able to share together. We are, my wife and I are more connected than we've ever been. Our relationship with my children is amazing. And I can proudly say that I've been sober for about a year and a half now. I was introduced to Celebrate Recovery through Compass. And I'm finally, after <laughs> close to 50 years, I've finally taken off the mask. And who you see before you is the person that God needs me to be. If you're ready to take off the mask, let me tell you some steps that you can take to initiate that process. Number one, admit that you've lost control. Just to be honest and real with yourself, if not with others. Just to say, you know what? I am not in control of this anymore. Number two, reach out to a process, to a power that's bigger than yourself. Reach out to God and say, God, I'm at the end of my rope. I can't do this alone. I need your help. He's the one that initiates breakthrough. And so you just cry out to him. Reach out to others who can help. You're not meant to fight this battle alone, which kind of leads to number three, which is surrender to a process. And there's all sorts of great methods and processes out there, AA meetings, eating plans like Whole30. There's lots of great things. But we have this card that was on your seat today. Would you just take a look at that card real quick? There are some ministries on there that if you support us financially, you're already paying for anyway. You ought to take advantage of them <laughs> right here. But I just want to highlight right there, care and support ministries. That might be something that you need to catch and be a part of. His story, coaching and counseling. I can't recommend that highly enough. I want to really push you. If you need counseling, make sure you check them out. Celebrate Recovery. It's a great ministry that meets on Tuesday nights. We utilize the group with our Colleyville campus. And man, it's a great community of people who are real and honest with themselves and with others to start to achieve breakthrough and to start to practice living in a place that says, I know sin is not my master. And so I'm going to learn how to live and to say, I don't have to say yes to this. You're not going to be Bruce Lee overnight fighting off your addictions. That's not how it happens. But you get in the gym, you start training and developing and taking control control of your mind again, taking control of your desires and your actions. The fruit that's there will be seen for generations as your kids look back to you, as your friends look back to you, as the people that work with you look at you and say, man, something's different about you. 
Thank you for being here today. I wanna hear about your breakthrough. If you would come tell me, or if you're ready to take a step and say, you know what, I wanna follow Jesus and I wanna break free of strongholds in my life, I'll be right down here by the stage. Would love to talk to you about that after the service. And if you're new around here, make sure you stop by our Next Steps area before you leave and grab a gift as our way of saying thanks for being here with us today. I'll see you next week. You're dismissed.